Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sledgehammers in the Office podcast where we celebrate the heavy hitters on the job site and in the office. Today, I'm super excited. I've been waiting for this episode for probably three years now. Uh, it's with Mr. Gordon Henderson of Builder Digital Solutions. So, sir, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Absolutely. Um, so, we start every show with our guests with their work experience, what they're doing now, and some of the details with all of that. So, if sure. you were to kind of bring us up to speed with what you've done previously and kind of your explanation of what you guys do inside the company. Sure, we'll absolutely. So, um, hmm, I guess it's kind of a long story, right? And I'll st- I, started, I started as an electrical engineer, so that was, that's my, my degree is, a, is engineering. Um, when I graduated with that degree, I worked for my dad's company. Um, he had a, a electronics manufacturing company, so uh, did that for a while. Um, Bounce between a couple of different jobs related to manufacturing of electronics, you know, re- related to my degree. And in about 2001, I kind of quit my day job. Actually, it's 2000. Uh, quit my, no, it's 2001. I quit my day job, right? It was like a month after 9 11, which was a scary time to like quit your day job, you know, because didn't know exactly what was going to be happening in the economy and so yeah. forth. Uh, to start a business with my uncle. And, um, it was focused on the body shops. So we, we built a business around that, um, spent about 10 years bootstrapping that, building it up, and then sold that to a, uh, a publicly traded company that was in our space and uh, worked for them for the next five years. And um, during that time, I was uh, tapped to help uh, lead a new business division that they created, which included our product and a bunch of others. Um, and after a little while, I just kind of realized how much I really liked being part of small business. So the business that we built was a small family business and, um, I really enjoyed that. I loved the freedom of, you know, being able to make a decision and just implement it, you know, without a lot of red tape and, um, just sort of the grind of starting your own small business. And so I left that in 2016 to basically start what we're doing now with Builder Digital Solutions, which is our legal name, but we um, go to market with uh, our trademark, which is uh, 149 Photos. So we started that, which was really a rebuilding of a previous iteration of the business. It's kind of, that, that's a really long story. But, um, you know, when the market crashed in 2007, 2008, the previous business that was focused on new home construction, you know, really kind of died with the industry. So we started again in 2016, built everything from scratch. We're operational in 2017. So. My role today as president, co-founder, and CEO of Builder Digital Solutions is like I'm very focused on the strategic, like what what, what do we want to grow this into? You know, how do we get there? Um, I'm also very, you know, I'm technical, leveraging my engineering background. Um, so I, you know, I'm responsible for all the architecture and in the structure of how we do things from an operational standpoint, processing images, um, and then like all the legal stuff and HR stuff. So we, you know, one thing. Obviously, as you build a small business, you have to wear a lot of hats, and you know, that's you know, good, bad, or, or indifferent. Like that's that's the reality. Unless you've got a lot of money to start with, and you can hire those functions out. But if not, you're going to wear a lot of hats. And so we tend to wear a lot of hats. Yeah. So that's um, kind of what got got me to where I'm at. You know, kind of a serial entrepreneur, I guess you'd say. I mean, over the years, I, there's been lots of little businesses that I've like dreamt up and kind of started. I mean, I started when I was a kid, basically, like, you know, um, and I joke about it with my wife, but, um, you know, when I was a kid, like, oh, you know, I want, I need to repair my bike. Well, I can maybe make a little repa- bike repair business and, you know, charge money for this, you know? <laughs> so watching, especially my dad start his business and, you know, started in our basement in, he grew it. He sold it. Um, you know, when he sold it, I think there was like 80 or 100 employees working uh, for the business. So you know, it was a pretty sizable small business or medium-sized business. So the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit was kind of in my blood, and um, so I've started uh, lots of different things over the years. And anytime my wife would like make something, like she would make a gift or whatever for for. Um, for like a baby shower or whatever, I was like, how many of those do you think you can make in a week? <laughs> just like, just forget it. It's just a gift. Leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. So, so how did your experience growing the business from, was it 2001 to 2013? Uh, 2001 to 2011. I mean, 
I was involved with it after we sold it, but right. yeah, when we sold it was 2011. Okay. Yeah. And how did your experience there start to shape what you're doing now? Do you feel like things are accelerated because there's a lot of experience behind what you're doing now that you can start to choose your steps yeah. a little more wisely? And oh, what is that? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Mac, Mac couldn't, couldn't help but interject. Um, does it accelerate? 100%. Um, you know, obviously, if you just ignore all the lessons learned, then I guess maybe it's not going to help you. Yeah. But um, if I guess you, maybe the better question would be, what have you seen accelerate because of that experience? Yeah. Um, well, any, I mean, it, it touches every aspect of the business, um, even from just like getting started. Like, okay, what do I do? Uh, you know, how do I incorporate? Um, should I be an S Corp or an LLC or a C Corp? Um, you know, all those questions are kind of answered for you. And, you know, okay, I'm going to get an attorney. Here's how we're going to set it up. You know, I mean, we can get this thing going right away. Um, it also affects things like, okay, well, I went through the experience of selling a company. I know what a pain that is in terms of, like, you have to, get, you got to dig up everything you ever signed. And if you start, not like you're going to start every business saying, oh, I'm going to sell this one day. I mean, you might. But when you have gone through that experience, you think, you know what, if I organize this a little better, this will be so much easier later if this ever comes up. Or, you know, you may transition it to another family member or something. But whatever you're going to do, like, you know, setting up the infrastructure of, like, your all your legal stuff and all that, you know, if you can do that smart from the beginning, it's going to make life way easier later. And so, you know, those kinds of lessons... Um, you know, when we built the first business technology in terms of like the web it was so different, like AI was like kind of untouchable unless you had a PhD. Um, this time around when I, when we started building this business, I was like, okay, everything I basically learned there, I'm going to kind of scrap because I know it's at least 10 years old okay. and technology changes too fast. So I had to basically relearn, okay, how do you build a modern application today? Like what's the best way to do it? Um, and in my role after we sold, like, I, I didn't do anything with code, right? I, I, that wasn't part of my job responsibility anymore. I was, you know, sort of um, more strategic and, you know, managerial. So I had to learn a lot of new stuff. So I rolled up the sleeves and, you know, got on the interwebs and <laughs> learned all about, like, what, what's, the, what's the right way to craft a, an application today? So that was, that was new. But um, you know, even in that process, I still... I still learned, okay, I know I need, we need to have this. I know we need to have that. You know, I mean, there was lessons care that carried over for sure. Um, but, you know, it's a whole new technology. And then with AI being a lot more accessible than it was in 2001, certainly, or even like 2005, 2010, like, I, I once made the mistake on a podcast of calling it easy, AI being easy. It's not easy. It's just you don't have to have a PhD, to do it like you know if you're kind of technical um and you're willing to learn some new things you can you can learn how to leverage ai in um you know there's, there's lots of opportunities to do that yeah which was interesting to me uh i sat down with steve mm -hmm. in july and before that i listened to the interview i had with him from uh, was that 2020 mm -hmm. and he was talking about AI and at the time kind of like just glossed over it in my head but with chat GPT and all these other things yeah um, becoming a lot more prevalent out there I was yeah. like you guys seem to be ahead of that curve on the popularity side so was that something that you had come across previously or something that you just knew in the industry is was the industry tapping into that or before general population or how did you guys start doing that so here, here, this is the honest truth how it started for us it was basically a, a customer complained about something and um it was um a picture of some scaffolding in you know in one of the one of the shots that we'd taken and somebody over there really i mean there was nothing wrong with the picture like it didn't it didn't show somebody doing something unsafe or scaffolding not set up properly they right. just I think an attorney or somebody like just didn't like. I, uh, I'm not so comfortable with uh, having pictures of the scaffolding. And so we're like, okay, then no problem. We can we can make those private. But I'm like, man, there's got to be a good way to do this such that it's you know, reviewing every single image, which we do, 
um, you know, it's okay, got to look for this. Oh, now this builder doesn't want that. And, you know, there's just so much and, you know, humans are not perfect. Especially when you start to scale. Yeah, when you get start to scale. Like right now we're processing like about 50,000 images a week. So, you know, that's, that's a lot to depend on a manual, you know, inspection process, which is never 100%, you know. If you're doing 80% effectiveness on a manual inspection process, you're doing pretty good. Um, and so... I was like, okay, I, we need to build like an image classifier to detect scaffolding and help us to determine if a photo should be made private or not. Um, and so we did it. I mean, we built it in just, a, it took us just a couple of months to get it in production. Um, at that time, Google had a great, it was in their, I think their alpha phase of this product called AutoML. I think they call it something different now. Um, and so I jumped on board with that, got it to work. I'm like, okay, this actually kind of works pretty effectively. And we did other things other than just like detect scaffolding. We just said, hey, let's just train it. Like if it's a messy work site that maybe it would suggest to make it private, you know, lots of debris, you know, when they're putting in insulation or putting in drywall, like it's, it's, it's a mess, right? There's just no way around it. Um, and so detect those kinds of things and make them private. So we trained it on all kinds of different specific things that we wanted to look for in an image, including scaffolding. And, um, you know, a couple months we had it in production and it was actually working pretty good. And so it's just grown, you know, tremendously since then. But it really it came out of a need from a customer that was like, said, you know, we don't like this. And we're like, okay, that's fine. Um, and when we had to find a solution so that I want it to be repeatable, I want it to be, you know, not left up to chance that we're going to catch that, but, you know, be pretty solid that we're going to catch it every time. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So Steve does a lot of the sales. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as the way I understand it, you're managing a team that takes care of a lot of the back end with mm -hmm. creating those systems and processes. So yep. what does it look like in the management of that team? Do you guys have um, a brick and mortar that you guys show up at? Do you guys all work remotely? Do you have people all over the U.S.? Or uh, is it local to Michigan? All of the above? Where does that go? Uh, it's it's actually the one thing that you didn't list there is all over the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the team's actually all over the world. Um, we from the very beginning we we've, we've not had a brick and mortar location. Um, our customers are all over the country. Um, you know, some clustered in some areas more than others, like a lot in Texas. And um, so it just didn't really make sense to have a physical presence. You know, to when we have customers everywhere. Um, so we've been virtual since, you know, before it was cool with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the team is virtual. I mean, when we started, this whole thing was me. You know, I did, I did all of the, of the tech development. Um, but fortunately, I have a team behind me now. Um, so, it, it, you know, management of that team basically consists of, you know, we, um, we have a, a Kanban board of all the features that we want to develop. Um, and we meet weekly with a stand-up basically virtual stand up with this team and talk through what we want to do this week and they build it. We, you know, we have a QA and testing and all that good stuff. And then uh, the next week we look at what we want to do next week. So it's a basically kind of a weekly cadence um, looking at the features that we want to do. We don't necessarily release every week, but we release about every other week. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it works, it works pretty good. Uh, the teams, you know, if you work with um, the, the developers long enough, um, you know, they really get to know your system, right? Where you don't have to describe, like if you want to build a new feature, you, you don't have to describe it in infinite detail like you would maybe when you first got started because they know how everything works. They know the architecture. Um, so you can be a lot more, um, you know, give them cliff notes essentially of like, okay, here's what we want to build. Maybe here's a little mock-up and, you know, they can fill in the gaps and it usually works pretty good. But, you know, you got to re reach a certain maturity with your team before that, that really is possible. Yeah. With that maturity, do you are they independent contractors a lot of time? Are they W two and how does the management of that team work in regards to you guys meet once a week? But you hear I've heard personal stories about mm -hmm. people who uh, they're working remotely and oh I just need to wiggle the mouse every once in a while and I don't get in trouble type of a thing. And with being a small company, I've been a part of a couple. It's yeah either everyone's pushing in the same direction or you're gone. Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately, um, with this team that I work with, that, that has not been a problem. In fact, they, they, they tend to work faster than I can give them work to do, um, which is a good problem. Um, 
but yeah, that really hasn't been a problem. Um, now this is a another company, so they're you know they're all subcontractors. They're not they're not on payroll um, as W twos, um, and so they have all kinds of processes and controls within. The nice thing about working with this company is they have all kinds of processes and controls within their company for for just what you just talked about. Um, you know, I can at any time say, you know what, I don't want to work these developers right here. They're just not working out. I need somebody else. And that's, that's always, you know, that can always happen. Um, but they, they're generally can do things faster than I can basically define, you know, for each, each new feature that you want to, you got, you got to you know, show some screenshots or some mockups and, you know, how you want things to work. Um, it takes some time. Sometimes the describing of the new feature can take longer than it takes to actually do the code, you know? Oh, really? So yeah, depending on what it is and how complex, but you know, it's an important step because you can't just, you know, leave it up to chance what they're going to produce. Right. Yeah. You know, but no, it's, it's, it's actually been, it's worked pretty well. Now, I, I understand how, you know, you can get in situations like you described where it just, it's not working. Like, you know, and to me, um, that's, uh, that's a situation when you have a values misalignment, you know, um, core values, you know, in one of the, you know, one of the core values being that, you know, we're going to do whatever it takes to get the job done. And if, if you're not aligned on that, then, you know, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the, do you guys set your core values and then revisit those commonly? And if so, how many do you have? And what's the stuff that you guys call to mind quite yeah. often? Yeah. Um, I think establishing core values for a, an organization is super important. Um, you know, we didn't do it day one. Like we said, okay, we're going to open the bank account and get the paperwork <laughs> signed and work on core values today. Like, like actually that probably wouldn't be a bad idea, especially if you're, you know, working with a business partner, like, like I do, you know, you want to make sure you're on the same page, right? If you, you got this set of core values and they have this set and if like they don't overlap, like that's a big problem. You're going to have some headaches guaranteed. Um, so we didn't do it day one, but we did it fairly early on. And that was one of the th lessons I learned from my previous experience is like having a set of core values and having like a long-term vision of the, what the, the business is, um, you know, say in three or five years or what, you know, what, what it's going to look like and like specifically detail that out. Like that was super powerful because when you actually write it down and you think it through, you know, what, what you want this thing to be someday, it's amazing just going through that process, how much of it will come true. I, can I attribute it all to that? No, I think it, but I think it plays a big role in it. So I would say to anybody who's thinking about starting a company or you know starting an organization, talk about core values, talk about like a three-year or five-year vision of what this is early. You don't, you don't have to like be a million dollars in revenue to have that conversation. Right. You can have it, you could have it day one, yeah. absolutely. You know, most don't, but you, you absolutely could. Um, and where the core values take, where they become important is, you know, when you're looking to hire somebody, you want to look, you know, ask yourself, do, does this person coming on board align with our core values? Like convince me that they do, because if they don't, it's just going to be, it's not that that's, that's a, that's a bad person or that they don't have value. It's just, they're going to fit better somewhere else. Yeah. You know? It's um, a filter for decision making. It's also point. a filter for decision making. So hiring for sure, but even like when you're when you have a, a tough choice, well, what should we do in this situation? Oh, I don't know. Well, it doesn't hurt to go back and, and go check through your core values. Okay, are we you know are we um, committed in this? Are we leaving things better than we found it? You know, go through your actual core values and say, well, no. If we make this decision, we're going to violate these. Well, then. If your core values don't actually ever come up in a decision-making process, then they're kind of meaningless. I mean, right. you, you know, you put them on the wall and like, oh, we feel good. Yay. Yeah. Like, you know, we're, we're all about, you know, this or that. And, but if they don't actually impact how you conduct business, then they're, it's just, it's like a, it's just like a poster on the wall that makes you, gives you a warm fuzzies, but doesn't actually have any bite to it, you know? Yeah. A lot of people talk about not getting into business with a business partner because, it can end a lot of times like a business divorce. And mm -hmm. yep. uh, this is your second time around mm -hmm. with a business partner that's also family. Yep. So how has that experience been? And then is a lot of that attributed to the core values and the vision that you guys say, hey, we're aligned on operating this way. And then also the direction that we're going for the next several years. Yeah. And how do you guys start to manage that when you start feeling pulled in different directions? Yeah. Um yeah, you're totally right. 
Um, obviously, there's a, there's a different dynamic when you have a business partner because um, it's not all just one person making all the decisions. Um, in both situations, I was kind of the driver of like, hey, we should do core values in a, in a vision. And, and it's not because I'm so smart or whatever. Like, you know, I'm, I am constantly trying to learn. And I came across this, you know, this is way back, like, I don't know, 2003 or four when we were a few years into that previous venture. I'm like, oh, this really rings true to me. We should do this. And fortunately, in both cases, the business partner was like, oh, that sounds great. Let's do it. Like, they were, they were engaged and leaned into it. You know, um, so that's that's important. Obviously, that that's an indicator of how aligned you are as business partners. Like, if they're just like, eh, that's stupid. Like, oh, okay. Well, we don't. We're, you know, we're we're not seeing things eye to eye, right? Like, like we, I want to be serious about. You know, part of what I want to do is build a great build a great business, right? I want something that you know has a bigger impact than just me. You know, um, one of our core values is to leave things better than you found it. And um, that's, you know, that's all about people. You know, I want our employees to think, oh, man, I, I really gained a lot by being a part of this organization. Like, I learned a lot. Of course, I made money, but I, I got so much more than just that. And we want that for our customers, too, you know, where they're like, wow, working with these guys is just really great. Like, so that's, that's one of our core values, leave things better and find it. So I want to build something that's bigger than me. And to do that, you got to have a vision and you got to have, you know, core values. And so in, in both cases, um, it was like, hey, I've come up with these core values. This is what I think they should be. No, it was like a, a process. You worked on it together. And like when Steve and I did it, like we, um, I have this little flashcard deck of, um, of uh, core values, the potential core values, right, that I got when I went through a Dale Carnegie course on vision, mission, and values a number of years back. So I, I kept this deck because I thought this is really good stuff. And, uh, you know, you go through the deck and you're like, man, every one of these is good. How can, how can not every single one of these be a core value? Well, you can't. You can't have 50 core values, right? <laughs> and so we go through this process where, you know, we got we to gotta winnow it down to, like, my six and his six. And I think, like, four or five of the six overlapped. So, like, okay, we're already going into this kind of with the same vision. Like, we... We both value the same things, I and mean, we tweaked it, and you know it was an iterative process, but um, you know it was really good. At the end of the day, it's it's our values. It's not just my values, his values. You know, it's our values. But partnerships can be tough, and I know um, my dad and his business in the very early on stages, like this is when I was a little kid. Um, you had a business partner, and it did not go well, um, and they did have to part ways, um, and that wasn't a great experience. So you're entering to a business relationship with a partner, it's, there's an extra level of complexity, but in, like in both cases for me, like um, where I'm weak, the other one's strong, and where they're weak, I'm strong. So if you have identical sets of skills, um, maybe that's a problem. Maybe you need to have, you know, you need to kind of balance each other. Um, the other thing too is like, ne- both of us are not afraid to disagree or to say, hey, I don't think that's the way we should. Like, if, if you agree on everything, then one of you is redundant. So, you know, there should be some disagreement and that's healthy. You know, you should, you should be able to push each other and say, yeah, are we sure we want to do that? And it's not necessarily that you're going to come, you know, the head, you know, like, okay, like that. But it's just more like, let's stop and think about, should we really go in that direction? Does that make sense? And so when you have two people, you got the benefit of that. So that's, that can be a very good thing. Yeah. Transitioning a little bit to uh, the customer side, talk to Steve as far as mm-hmm. in regards to the, some of the products that you guys deliver, not just from taking the photos that get presented to the, the new homeowner, but also some of the things that you do uh, to be able to allow for a smoother building process so that mm-hmm. the builders can access each house along the way. Uh, when you're trying to build out the pricing for the package that you're going to sell to whatever builder it is, uh, how much does that change in regards to the, the amount of houses, the amount of things that they want included with the package that they're going for? Is it a fixed price? Is it a per unit price? How, and how do you guys even go about doing that when you have unique products, especially when it's like, all right, we've got something new to present to someone yeah. and establishing the value. I saw on your website that you're trying to get a, is it nine times return on investment? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I know Steve was talking about that as well to say like, you guys are killing that for your builders. So 
Uh, how do you price it to say we're staying within that, but make sure that it's appropriate for the work that you've put in in development? Yeah, um, you should, as a business owner, have a very good understanding of your costs. Like, you know, so laying out your cost model, uh, your direct costs and, and your indirect costs as well, but really focusing on the direct costs, like, you know, what are your margins? Uh, what's your gross margin? Like, if you if you can't understand that and know that, um, then you're, you're going to be, I think, in trouble in, in terms of how you're going to price things. Because you can't just guess, you know, stick your finger in the air and just, no, maybe this will work. Um, but having said that, you know, we work with our builders uh, or prospective clients. Um, you know, a lot depends on their volume, of course. It's just like anything else. Like if you can bring me more business, I can, I can sharpen the pencil and get you a better price. Uh, and we definitely do that. Um, you know, as we saturate a market, as we get more, you know, footprint and market share in a market, it's easier for us to take on a smaller client um, because we're already there and we just kind of add it to our routes of our photographers. And so we can maybe be a little more aggressive on pricing if we, if with a smaller builder that doesn't have as much volume in like a, in a market like Dallas, for example. Um, but if it's in a new market and they're a small builder, you know, if they're kind of off, off the beaten path a little bit, then we can't be as aggressive on the pricing because, you know, we got to go out there and we're going to set it up just for you. And, uh, you know, we got to manage that. Obviously we got to be out there every week. If somebody gets sick, steps on a nail, hopefully that doesn't happen very often, thankfully. Um, you know, we got to go, we got to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if it's a small market, that's more challenging. We can't be as aggressive on our side of the pricing. So long story short, uh, it all depends, right? Volume definitely has a, has a big impact on it though. If you're going to commit to, um, a lot of homes, then we can be more aggressive on the pricing for sure. Just because it's with this, it's, it's not a one for one transaction. As far as you, you're not going to the store, here's a dollar, here's an apple. Right. It, since it's software, it's a lot easier to be per, on a per customer basis with that. Well, it's, I mean, if you think about it though, like no matter how many homes you build, I still got to have somebody come out there every single week. Right. So I can't, I can't, uh, I don't get any volume discounts on that. Right. Um, so in the, the software, like, you know, everything's in the cloud. Hardware, you know, disk space is super cheap. Um, so there's not a lot of economies of scale so much, so much there. It's just really more of a commitment. Like you're going to commit, uh, you know, a certain volume to me, then, uh, then I'll, you know, I'm willing to take a slightly lower margin in order to make it happen. Yeah. And obviously some of, a lot of our customers, you know, the clients are very, it's very strategic for us. So most large builders, um, each of the divisions, you know, so like Phoenix is an example as a division. Of a, of a big builder, you know, they're basically autonomous. We don't see a lot of big builders um, that like make a decision at the top and just push it, push it down to everybody. Say, hey, you have to do this. Like, that'd be great if we only had to deal with one person, <laughs> sell them on our product, and they just say, oh, all of a sudden, you know, now we're shooting five thousand homes extra per year. That would be great. It just doesn't t tend to work that way. There are probably some builders that are like that. I, our experience is that most are not. And so, you know, our strategy typically is like get a beachhead customer. Um, do a great job, deliver great service. They're going to talk to their other, you know, um, colleagues that are in a similar role in other divisions. That'll create opportunities for us there. But it doesn't happen overnight. And you know, you got you still got to deliver great service and give them a good reason to sing your praises. So that's obviously super important. Yeah. And then when I talked with Steve, he talked. Uh, he mentioned that some of the products you guys. Uh, deliver to your builders is going to be based on when they're like, oh, it'd be really cool if you did this. Mm -hmm. So how long does it usually take from the moment someone says it would be really cool to when you can roll it back out? You said that you've got your board that you guys work through mm -hmm. on a weekly basis to say, all right, how can we start implementing these things? But uh, how, what's the life cycle for once you go through idea to implementation and assuming that it's not a, this needs to be brought to the front of the line immediately? Yeah. So if it's something that's just purely a code change, you know, um, an enhancement to the the UI that they use, that's much easier. Like if it's something that affects the boots on the ground, where we got to bring in like a, some different camera or do some different procedure, it's that's that can be a little more challenging. But if it's just software, you know, usually depending, well, let's put it this way: 
if it's a feature that we think, oh, all of our customers will benefit from, then you know that may, raises it in terms of priority. If like only one, say one person's going to benefit from it, and not even a whole division, then we're like, well, that won't get as much priority, but you know, still going to get on the list. Um, but generally speaking, like if somebody says, hey, I want to do this or that, it could be anywhere from a week to a month, depending on how complex the feature is and how much testing we need to do, but. You know, it could be as fast as a week if it's something really urgent, or about a month usually, to get something implemented. What does the testing look like on the back end? Um, it's basically you know come up with a, a simple test plan. It'd be dep again depending on the complexity of the feature, and we have QA people that are responsible for going through that test plan, creating a automated sort of like program for the testing. So it it actually simulates kind of a user going in and clicking, and like are you getting the expected results that you're that you're wanting to see. That's pretty cool. Because one of the things you you know you learn from doing co developing code long enough is sometimes you create a new feature and think, oh, this is simple, it's not going to impact anything else, and you wind up breaking something else that you oh I forgot that yeah I could see. So <laughs> you need to kind of build this program of testing so that you can automate that so that if you any changes you make you want to make sure that the core functionality that you're expecting to continue to work properly still works. So those are some of the things you learn after doing code development long enough. How often does that happen? Not very often. I mean, it's happened a few times. I mean, the other complexity with building um, stuff for the web is, you know, people use different browsers. So okay. all, all, all my developers are on Chrome. Well, that's great. You know, up until recently, I mean, within the last year, like all the big builders were like on Internet 11, uh, Internet Explorer 11. I'm like, oh. I hate IE 11. It's awful. <laughs> uh, and so, but you know, if your developers are on one platform and your customers are on something, well, then you better test on that other platform because that's what your customers, you know, a, right. a lot of them are using, right? So two thirds of them or whatever. And so, thankfully, they've all kind of gotten off that now and, and moved on to another browser because that one was painful. Um, but yes, every now and then you do you do wind up breaking something. And a lot of times it's because if you're not paying attention to some of the other browsers that people are using. Okay, and that makes like, sense. Oh, it works, it works just fine for me. And then, oh, IE 11, yeah, that doesn't work. So you have to go back and figure out why and then fix it. So That's interesting. Yeah. What does your day-to-day -day look like? Are you pulled a lot out of the programming side of it? You're not the one coding as much. So what yeah. does your day-to-day -day look like? Um, it's really kind of about, you know, I, hmm, I don't know if you've heard of something called the, the, the tyranny of the urgent. It's a Dale Carnegie thing, and I, I think he coined it from somebody else, but basically you kind of look at quadrants of, you know, important versus not important and urgent versus not urgent. Okay. And so a few years back, and especially as you're building a business, like you spend a lot of time on stuff that maybe is urgent but not important, you know, like the fires you got to put out, you know, just the daily grind stuff that comes up that you have to deal with. And as a business leader, I want to I want to position myself to be focused more on strategic stuff. It's important but not urgent, right? So it's important to the business in terms of growth, where we're going to be in three or four years. But it doesn't have to be solved today. But it's still important, right? So that's where I want to be operating. And so a few years back, I did an analysis of everything I'm doing. I'm like, wow, I'm spending 80% of my time in a quadrant I do not want to be in, like, and only like. 10% in the quadrant that I want to be in. And so, you know, you make some decisions. Okay, what do I got to do to change that? You know, what does is, what is my roadmap look like of my own personal development to make sure that I can start focusing on there? And I'm, I'm kind of convinced, but maybe certain companies, certain leaders, like you can, you can get there where you're basically spending most of your time on the strategic. But it's a constant battle. It's something I, I'm always looking at. Okay, should I really be doing this? Should somebody else be doing this? What systems do I need to put in place so that somebody else can do this? You know, so that, it's a constant battle that you have to be you have to be fighting. So a lot of my time's focused on that. How do I extract myself from the day to day so that the this thing runs like a well oiled machine? Gotcha. <coughs> I feel like a lot of people talk about the strategic part of it, and if they're not in the middle of it, then it's a buzzword that they use. So it's what does that look like practically for you guys in terms of like, I feel like some people are like, I'm going to be strategic and go build a spreadsheet real quickly. And it's like, eh, that's, that's cute. But when you're looking 
at what you guys are doing, what does that look like? Um, I think part of it is like a 10 year plan, three year plan, a one year plan, you know, um, like what, what do we want to be when we grow up? Mm -hmm. Um, what's this business look like in three years and how do we get there? You know, so are you looking for keystones that you need to be meeting along the way? It's a couple different things. One of them is like a detailed vision of like, oh, we're going to have a 2,500 square foot facility in Michigan. There's going to be 20 people working for us or, you know, 80 people, whatever, you know, whatever your numbers might be. Um, you know, uh, we're going to have, we're going to make the Inc. 5000 list, which we just did, by the way, that was, that was on our vision plan. We just, we just made it. Um, super excited about that. So it's, it's like those kinds of detailed things like, oh, we're going to be a recognized solution in the industry. You know, these are sort of long term. They're like they're not things you necessarily have achieved yet. And some of them are, you know, definitely stretch goals. But like, what do you what do you want to be when you grow up? What does it look like in, in detail? And if you can create sort of a vivid plan of what that looks like. I don't know. I, just, I, I feel I, my personal belief is that that you, it helps to kind of bring that to reality if you can kind of have this clear vision in your mind, like with specifics. So, yeah, it's not. Is it a budget and a forecast and a business model? Yeah, it's it's that too. But I think having that sort of specific vision of what you're trying to build and what it's going to look like is the, is the first thing. How much of that includes trying to factor in if it's an economy shift? Uh, shifts inside the industry, things of that nature, so that yeah. trying to almost allow for that fudge room of when things go wrong. Yeah. Um, this is where I think something called the SWOT analysis comes in, like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And this is sort of part of your sort of three-year planning-ish, um, where you're you know, you're, these things are constantly evolving as you're growing the business and you get new opportunities and you, you know, enhance your solution. You know, strength, new strengths come up, you know, your weaknesses, hopefully you're minimizing or mitigating or eliminating, you know, opportunities and threats. So um, I think doing that analysis really helps you to kind of craft that vision of what, what the future is going to kind of look like and what things you need to be working on. That's that's part of that's part of this. It's like it's a tool set in the toolbox. You know, there's lots of different things. You know, it, it's not like you said. Oh, I, I got a spreadsheet, so now I'm I'm strategic. It's it's definitely more than that. Um, the other thing I think really helps is to have a framework to work out of. And a few years ago, we adopted EOS. Um, it's the Entrepreneur Operating System, and it gives a lot of these tools. Um, for not only setting up your, your vision for the future, your core values, but also how do you conduct like your, your weekly stand-up meetings so they're effective and they're not drains. Like, and they also actually help give you traction towards your goal. So uh, adopting a framework like, you know, there's a million ways to, kill, or to you know, skin the cat. Um, it takes a lot of effort to create something from scratch plagiarism's a lot faster. So <laughs> if this works and there's tens of thousands of companies around the world using EOS as a platform, like, okay, well, let's just, let's just adopt that, you know, yeah. and tailor it to our business. So that's what, that's one of the things that we've done too. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, when I was doing a little research, I found out you have, you were, your name is listed on a couple patents. Oh yeah. So what was that process look like? I feel like that was something I would hear about like, oh, you could create a product, get a patent, and uh, then there's all kinds of mystique around it at times, but what does that look like? What are the requirements to even get something patented? Because going off of what you said, like mm -hmm. plagiarism is a quick way to get somewhere. So how do you ensure that it's like, all right, this qualifies, that this is unique and a patentable thing process mm -hmm. or whatever? Yeah, um, so I've got, three patents that I'm listed as a chief inventor and then we got one in the process right now. Um, lesson number one, don't, don't ever try to do it yourself. You know, just like <laughs> don't do neurosurgery yourself. Don't, don't do a patent yourself. That's my experience. Um, it's, it's a complicated process. There's a complicated lingo. There are steps interacting with the patent office that like, you know, a layman's not going to understand unless you're doing this every day. So you're going to need to get a patent attorney. Um, 
you can get you can get started kind of relatively inexpensively with filing a provisional patent, which basically kind of gets your idea in the in in the process. Um, it's like good for a year, and by the end of the year, you got to file a full patent. And if any of this has changed, then forgive me, because you know I don't do this every day. But um, it, but it's a complicated and a long process. We're talking years, not months, but years. Um, in my experience, in terms of putting the patents together, they, they're written in this uh, somewhat of a way that, like, just like normal humans don't talk this way. And so, you know, patent attorney is going to know how to write it so that it'll make sense to the examiner, and you know, and how to interact. Um, but like mo all the patents, multi years, going back and forth. Oh, they don't like this. Okay, wait, what? Okay explain to them that like they don't they don't understand like how, why this is different from what they're citing so it, it's a long complicated process and ours the one we're on right now i think we started in 2018 maybe 19. so yeah it's been four years and we're still still prosecuting the uh, the case hopefully we'll get it but you just never know and and, and the other i guess the other thing i've learned about patents is you know, unless you're AT and T or, or something like, I probably shouldn't even say this, but like they don't necessarily have the teeth that I thought that they would necessarily. Meaning, like, oh, I got a patent now. Let's go out and sue everybody. Like, that's dumb. Um, you know, I, I I would expect in some, um, you know, for some companies and in some markets, they're super important. You know, for what we're doing, not maybe not as important, but I still I still like the idea of having them. It um, I think it raises some of the value for potential investors, um, and it also just kind of illustrates I think in terms of your technology leadership that you're you're actually doing stuff that is innovative and making a difference. How do you differentiate what you're doing from what's existing in the market? How like it seems that you get something sent back to you that says, well, this seems very similar to something that exists, so we don't know if we're going to give you a patent on that. How do you how do you recognize that, okay, we've got something different here, first of all, enough from the market? Is it just you, you have something that's so unique, and then it's a point of presentation to say, hey, no, 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 the, here's yeah. why it's unique, or... Yeah, um, it's, to me, uh, getting a patent approved is a little bit of a black art. I don't totally understand that would seem logical right but that's not necessarily the case i think okay. i mean it has to be it can't be patently obvious like it it can't be just something super trivial and, and totally obvious like that's not going to fly the other thing i look at when they when you're going through the process is they'll say well if you take this patent and this patent and this patent put them all together they then we have what you have and so one skilled in the art would know by the teachings of this this and this to build what you have and so now it's not patentable so they'll do things like that, um, you know, and it's like, well, how do you know, you know, there's millions of patents. So how do you know what's out there? You know, it's, it's just really complicated. That's where an attorney is going to really help you. That's interesting. Yeah. Is that a point of emphasis that you guys feel like is a strength when you go to some of these negotiations with the, the builders to be able to say, hey, like, at if you were to get this patent approved that you get to roll in with, hey, we've got a patented technology to use as an emphasized sales point, or is that more, like you said, on the potential sale or potential valuation of the company? Yeah, I, I think the I think the customers probably could care less. Okay. I mean, they, for them, they're gonna wanna know, you know, um, are your people professional? Do they take great pictures? Do they, are they, are you consistent? Are you gonna do? Not gonna shoot anything that's gonna embarrass me. Um, you know, I think that's what they really care about. You know, how how are you responsive to our requests for help or for you know changes? That's what they care about. Now, if the fact that you have a patented technology that helps you do all those things, well, that's great. But I don't think most customers probably don't care. It's all about execution at that point. Yeah, yeah. You deliver. That speaks volumes. Yeah. You know, whether you have a patent or not, I don't care. Like, wow, they're delivering. Who cares what? long as it's you know what's whatever whatever they're doing it's working so yeah I'll keep doing it want to talk a little bit about <coughs> uh, your time after you sold the business and mm -hmm. you mentioned the five years that you were still with them mm -hmm. uh, if I understand correctly you were a vice president of a division right 
So, and I, like I said, I've worked only for small companies. I've had some friends that have worked in more corporate roles and they talk about some of the executives and how they get hired and it almost seems like there was a mystique behind it. So mm. one of the questions that I had going in was how, what do you, when you look at someone saying, hey, if, if that's the goal that you wanna to get to inside a company, you wanna be a president, vice president of a division of the entire company itself, what are some of the skills that they have and what is the way that they should work up the corporate ladder? Because I, I'm assuming that in your position, you guys built a company, you had a proof of concept to say, hey, we know how to do this because mm -hmm. we are doing it. Just transfer me over and let me execute for you guys. Um, but what are some of the skills that you can recognize in yourself versus the marketplace that's like, hey, if you guys really tuned yourself up on X, Y, and Z, that opens up more doors for you rather than being stuck in the single job that you have. Yeah. Um, to me, it's, um, you know, it's a combination of a couple different things. One is you just, you got to want it. Like you, you want to be kind of, you're going to have to be naturally driven to take on more responsibility, right? I mean, if you're just comfortable punching a clock and leaving work at home, or leaving work at the office when you go home and you don't think about it, and that's like you're, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's like how you're wired. Then, you know, you probably shouldn't really try to do that because you're not really wired that way. But if you're wired to try to take on more responsibility and you want to grow, that's I think you know the number one thing you gotta have is is to be wired that way. Um, number two, I think you got to um, constantly be learning, like. I love learning new things. I think sometimes it drives my wife a little crazy because I'm always trying to bring out, you know, trying different things and you <laughs> like, wait, what, what did you, what did you buy now? Um, but I, you know, to, to have a constant thirst for knowledge and you know, to learn, to learn how to do things, you know, not only just learn what other people are doing, but learn how to do things better. I mean, well, probably even you know, back up. Very first thing is you got to know the business. You got to understand the business, the company that you're working for. Um, you know, you got to know inside and out, learn the numbers, learn, you know, uh, what customers think, uh, where are you weak? Where's the, where's the competition beating you? You know, you, you got to really understand that business and, and it doesn't mean you have to learn, know how to do every single job at that business, but I mean, you need to understand, understand the business, have a, have a desire to, to grow, which means if you get opportunities for, to take on more responsibility, take it, even if it's something you don't know anything about. Take it, show initiative, um, and then have that constant thirst for knowledge where you're constantly learning, learning new things. Um, and, you, and you should also be bringing ideas to the table, you know, saying, hey, I was thinking about our problem with the blah, blah, blah. You know, what if we did this? You know, you got to show some initiative, bring some ideas to the table and have that you know, drive, drive to want to grow in your responsibility. I think there's probably more, but that's just off the top of my head. Yeah. It seems that every once in a while there's this thought that maybe in some of that executive leadership, there's a different kind of thought process that happens or a different lingo that people go through because there's the scale is different. Would you just attribute that into learning about the business, learning about the position, things like that? And, uh, or do you feel like there is a certain, uh, business knowledge that you need to be able to be in those positions or even leadership knowledge to be in those positions? Um, I think, you know, could you go get an MBA and would that benefit you? Yeah, probably, depending on the organization you're trying to grow into. Um, there, there, is, there is different lingo, for sure. I mean, when we joined, like we were a small company when, with, when we were acquired and, um, you know, suddenly I was sort of thrust into the executive management team you know, for the U.S. and, you know, they were using a lot of words I'm like, oh, what the heck is that? You know, it's some of it's buzzwords and buzzwords change, right? I remember first time I heard a creative versus dilutive. I'm like, that's kind of a funny way to say it, but okay, I get it. Um, what is that? A creative means like uh, this, this helps, this, this is additive to whatever we're trying to do and dilutive is like, well, no, it, it pulls away from it. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if anybody uses that anymore. That might be, like two th way 2010 so <laughs> uh, um or even the first time like where I, I didn't didn't totally understand the difference between a forecast and a budget you know and like this is a publicly traded company like forecast is super important uh i learned it right away 
And actually now we actually produce a budget and a forecast. We update our forecast every month with our business. So being part of that larger organization, I learned some things that maybe probably most small businesses don't do. Um, small, medium sized businesses, but I like, well, this actually is really good. I, I'm going to integrate this into what we're doing, even though, you know, so forecast budget being one of them, what, yeah. what are a couple others that you recognize? Um, so sometimes being part of an, a bigger organization, like you learn things to do and sometimes you learn things not to do. Right. So I definitely, I learned both lessons really. But one of the things I, I learned was about, about the importance of having meetings that are impactful and meaningful and not just a waste of time. So like when you're definitely when you're part of a bigger organization, you can get pulled in a lot. Like everybody wants to copy you on emails. Everybody wants to like invite you to meetings that maybe you don't need to be a part of. And so like at one organization I was part of, I actually got to the point where like I was getting invited to so many meetings, not because I'm like, I'm this great guy or whatever, but it's because like they just invite God and everybody to every meeting for some reason. <laughs> and, uh, and so I got to the point where I like, I would start putting blocks of, you know, thought time, uh, focus time in my calendar, like leverage your can't like if the calendar is what's blowing up. Like you got to learn to leverage that tool. So I would put, I would constantly, like every week I'd go and I'd put blocks of time just so I could think. And so, you know, what people do when they schedule a meeting, they would normally look at everybody. When, when is everybody free? Well, I know they're never going to block it, you know, put it on that time because I've already blocked it off. And so, you know, you got to learn things like that. Um, being part of a larger organization, every organization has um, some, you know, politics, so to speak. And, you know, you can say, oh, I, I hate office politics like yeah I, I understand why people would say that and I'm not saying you got to like love it but you got to learn how it works like you got to learn how to operate in an environment like that um, and so every every company you got there's you know you got to learn who the who the players are and and you know what what their goals are in you know in order to succeed you, you can't just put a blind eye to all of that pretend like it doesn't exist because I don't like it well if you don't not that you like it, you don't have to like it, but you need to understand it so that you can kind of thrive and, you know, get, get to whatever objectives you're looking for as well. And your objectives, by the way, too, like if you're looking to grow in the business, it, it shouldn't be just for your own sake. It should be to help the business grow. Like if you're aligned with that, that's a good thing. And if it's just all about you, hmm, that's not a game I want to play. Yeah. You've mentioned meetings a couple of times as far as ineffective meetings versus effective meetings. Mm -hmm. I've been a part of ineffective meetings where everyone in the room looks like if someone threw a gun in the middle of the table, we'd all reach for it first. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I've heard some things in regards to, hey, you want to keep your meetings five to 10 minutes in and out, hit the bullet points. We're here just to communicate information, then get out. Um, or there's people who are, they want to be meticulous on presentation, things of that nature. When you're doing your weekly meeting to say, hey, here's the directive for this week. How do you try and make sure your communication is most effective going forward so the team understands what the goal is and uh, implementation without yeah. making everyone want to be like, let someone throw a nine millimeter in the side. Right. Um, well, part of it goes back to the, uh, the EOS framework, right? And so they have a framework for the meetings. It's called a level 10 or L10 meeting. Um, and you do it once a week and it has a very set agenda and it's 90 minutes and after 90 minutes you're done okay. so you know it's there's there's your there's a box time frame right um, and if, if you can't get it done in the 90 minutes then you schedule another meeting for that specific topic but it goes through exactly what you got to do um, you know part of um, the what they do in that meeting is there's a scorecard. So like, what are the key key metrics for how we're operating? At least, you know, it's, it's organized usually by sort of like group in the, in the company. So, you know, at, at the management level, obviously we're looking kind of like more macro level uh, metrics for the business. Um, and so you start by looking at the metrics and then you start looking at your quarterly goals. So, you know, like what are the, what are the main things that we got to get accomplished this quarter in order to be successful? So you start like really on the most important stuff then you get into the commitments of the to-dos, right? And then you get into the problem areas and you start trying to solve some of them. 
but you know, in any meeting, you're going to generate to do. So it's all it's it's also about accountability. So if there's something that's got to be done, it gets written down, and it's in there for the next meeting. It's one of the things you know you're going to go over. So when you write down a commitment like that, there's a higher probability that you're going to accomplish it because you don't want to really be at the next meeting going, "Oops, oh yeah, I totally forgot about that. I didn't do it." You know, you don't. Most people don't like the feeling that they get when they say that, right? And you want to say, "Oh yeah, I did that, and it's done." So it's really having that structure where it's not just like, hey, we're going to sit down and just chat about whatever. Like, no, there's a structure. We know it's going to be no more than 90 minutes. And the other thing is like, you know, you're seeing actual results. So you're actually like, wow, this is actually helping us move the business towards what we laid out as the most important things we want to accomplish. Like this is time well spent. You know, I actually kind of like doing this meeting. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just filtering it through as far as the ones that we went through. And I'm like, all right, that was not done in any way, shape or form where the opposite seemed to be done with that. Just because yeah. we were doing stuff where it's, I remember we had a stretch of meetings where for four months we had the same topic brought up over and over. There was nothing added to it necessarily. And so everyone knew like, all right, here we go. Just sit back, listen and, so to me, that's like you're not getting any traction, right? No. It's like your wheels are just spinning. Like, wow, we are not going anywhere. Yep. Um, if if that's if that's the case, right? So that's why this is really super hyper fo- focused on traction. You know, like positive movement forward. Yeah. Towards, but not towards just anything. Like actually towards the things that we said are the most important this quarter, and the things that we said we're going to do this year. Right. So it's, it's hyper focused on that. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm a person who loves production, so those meetings would just bore me. And then there's <laughs> meetings where you walk into and people are like, "We need to take things slowly." And I'm like, "I'm a production junkie, so like I need a to-do list by the end of this." So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, I did want to ask you about your experience with the sale of the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what does that look like? You've got you said uh, someone inside the space. They're coming to you, so they have an expertise on what you're doing so it's not that you're selling to a private equity firm and you have to educate someone on that i'm assuming uh but what was that like with the negotiation lawyers involved the contract that got signed and even like some of the timeline that you went through as far as did you approach them did they approach you what was that timeline like um it's very complicated i mean i never done had never done it before Mm -hmm. you know my dad sold his business so he had some experience that was a long time ago, right? And, you know, these things change, ebb and flow, valuations, all that stuff is constantly changing. I, even in the last year, I think, you know, with all the stuff with Silicon Valley Bank and stuff like all that stuff's changing constantly. Um, it's very complicated. Again, get an attorney. Don't, like, don't, don't even try <laughs> to do something like this on your own. Um, get, a, get a good accountant that understands like these types of transactions, like your normal accountant that like maybe balances your books and helps you with your taxes may not be the right one. They might, but like you should find somebody who specializes in this because they're gonna, gonna, at the end of the day, save you a lot of money. Um, It was very complicated. It took, we, um, it was several years, like the company we we sold to, we, we said no a couple times. It just wasn't the right deal. It wasn't the right time. And then when we finally did the deal, it's like, okay, this is the right deal. It's the right time. Um, so you got to be willing to say no. You got to be willing to walk away. If, like, all you want to do is sell your company, like, you're, I'm going to build I'm just going to... Um, that's not what I'm after. Like, I want to build a great company. I want to build something that's going to outlast me and, like, you know, be bigger than me. And I want to build a company that can thrive without my daily involvement in the minutia, right? I want to be there to, to set the strategy and, and think through big picture stuff. And, you know, I'm certainly focused on the technology too, but um, I want it to thrive without me having to be in there every single day doing all kinds of, you know, nitty gritty stuff. Going back to the quadrants. Yes, going back to the quadrants, exactly. Um, so where was I going with that? So w- when I, if, if you're, only goal is to just build a company and sell it as soon as you can. I, to me, that's not a great goal. Maybe I would rethink it. Like, think about maybe building a great company that has value. And if you build a great company that um, you know consistently produces profits, 
um, and is growing, you know, that's going to be valuable to somebody, most likely someday. But it's, it's still a long shot. So why not build a great company that maybe you don't want to even just think twice about selling? Like, why would I sell this? It's producing great profits. I really enjoy it. It could run, you know, without me having to do minutia every single day. Like, why would I want to sell that, you know? Um, but anyway, so it took a, it took a couple times so we got the right deal in the right time. And then when we did, it took, how long did it take? It took about eight months to get done. Our deal for them was really small. Like, it wasn't big enough to even have to report to their shareholders. Oh, wow. You know, it would be considered a non-material. Um, it was very material to us. <laughs> but, um, so it was not a really big deal. But, you know, I think the contract was like 80 pages long. I learned all kinds of stuff related to an acquisition that I knew nothing about before, all these different mechanisms for making sure that you know <clears throat> in case you didn't you weren't totally honest with everything and oh oh yeah we forgot about that lease that now is due and it costs fifty thousand dollars and oh we forgot to tell you about that that comes like six months later well it's not their first rodeo and they're going to have a provision to cover for that you know yeah so going through that and understanding it i was very involved with it um, i also had to dig up everything we ever signed and that was interesting I'd be going through boxes of stuff. I'm like, oh, crap. We signed an NDA like seven years ago. And I don't know, for some stupid reason, we gave them right of first refusal on the sale of the company. <laughs> well, and part of it was because we desperately wanted to do business with that company because we had nothing at that point. And we would have signed almost anything. Yeah. It's like, <clears throat> okay. I got to send this over to them, and then we're going to have to deal with this right of first refusal thing because they have a right of first refusal, and we don't want that. So, I mean, it was just like every other day I was digging up stuff like that and dealing with it. And so you had, you know, eventually we got done dealing with all that stuff, and we got the deal done. So, um, but it was now I think again, kind of getting back to what, what am I doing different? You know, now things are way more organized. I'm not going to be searching through boxes finding stuff that i didn't know about like i've got it all in one spot and somebody says i need to see everything you guys have ever signed send it no problem you know it'd be, it'd be much easier it doesn't mean there still wouldn't be some headaches and some negotiations and some back and forth i mean there was a ton of that um what were some of the big things in the back and forth was it the money was it uh ndas was it uh non-competes um I would say it's mostly like mechanic like in, in this in that particular case it was sort of an earnout. Like they it's not like, hey, here's a bunch of money, we own it now, you get to just go off and do whatever you want to do next. It wasn't that. They want you to stay. They want to make sure their investment not only continues to operate but actually grows. So you Was know. it built more like a seller finance deal then? No. No, it was more like, hey, here's Here's what we think it's worth. We're going to give you so much now, and then over the next three years, if the business performs, here's the here's what you'll get. Okay. And here's the rest. Okay. Right. And you know, I think that's pretty typical. Um, you know, for that size of a deal, I think that's pretty typical. And so there was just a lot of negotiations around that. Like, oh, well, here's the formula for the earnout. Um, and be like, well, wait a minute. But well, what if this happens? And you know, what about this? What about this scenario? So just a lot of that back and forth and. You know, I think so long as both sides are operating in good faith, you can work through them all. It's like, yeah, I get you. I see your point. Like, if you're not constantly trying to, like, just get the better of the other party and, like, you're actually, you know, seeing it from their perspective, too, you know, I think you can work through pretty much anything. And that it just took time to do all that. Yeah. Yeah. Five years from now, as you're forecasting, what's the vision that you're seeing for Builder Digital Solutions? Um, we want to be a um, we want to be a well known you know force in the market and you know I mean we're we're, we're getting towards that I mean more and more um, builders uh, know who we are and what we do understand you know I think the make like the basic value proposition but I we're not we're not there and we need to get there that's 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 I think sort of the highest at the highest level like the terms of the vision we want to be a well known um, force in the industry. Um, obviously, we want to grow our footprint with with our customer base, but we want, and, and we've actually kind of started to see it happen. From like when we first started, 
you know, thinking about our, our, our 2017 reboot, like not everybody got it, like understood like, okay, customers want to see these pictures every day, you know, every week. We're now, I think, especially with COVID, COVID changed a lot of things in terms of mindset. Like it, it shuffled the decks quite a bit in the industry. Now I feel like everybody talks to you like, yeah, of course they want to see it. Yeah, they want to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Duh. Like they like it, the mindset's completely changed. And um, so that's great. And, you know, I'm, I'm not taking credit for that. I don't think it's necessarily because of us. Uh, I think COVID probably had a bigger, bigger impact. But um, I think it gets that makes that a little easier. You know, um, we don't really have any direct competition in the marketplace. Like we're the only ones that like that are doing what we're doing and the way we're doing it. But we also we compete for do- dollar spend. So I, I don't pretend like oh, we have no competition. That's not true. Um, you know, if, if they're if our customers spending something out of a marketing budget, we're competing with. Well, maybe I want to spend that on Google Ads. You know, I mean that's that's who we're competing with. How do we spend mm-hmm. our money? Um, but yeah, to be a, a well recognized um, force in the industry is really kind of five years from now. If we can achieve that, then I think a lot of our other items on our vision board are going to be accomplished. That's awesome. All right, before we wrap up, we've got five quick questions for you. Okay. What's the most impactful thing you've learned? Um, my grandma, your great grandma, was uh, always said, can't, never could do anything. And so it has nothing to do necessarily with business. Like I didn't learn, a, it's not a business lesson. I was, my dad told me this like, from when I was knee high or whatever. Can't, never could do anything. And I think that's probably the most impactful. Basically, it means, you know, if you're, well, I can't do that. Like if that's your out-of-the-box answer, then yeah, you're right. You can't because you've already decided that you can't. So why not change your mindset? And think, well, I think I could do that and then go figure out how to do it. So that's probably the my favorite can't never could do anything what's your favorite movie that's a hard one i usually say I, that's impossible to say in favorite movie <laughs> I, I, can, I can give you my like top five but i would actually say I, I look at the movies that i watch the most over and over um this is going to be kind of obscure but uh clint eastwood in the outlaw josie wales i just love that movie <laughs> i want to be clint eastwood when i grow up someday your first character strength that comes to mind Integrity. I, I'm not saying necessarily mine, but like what I aspire for, it would be integrity. Would you take the worst Arizona summer day or the worst Michigan winter day? <sighs> That's a tough one. Okay, I guess I've never experienced the worst Arizona summer day. I guess the closest I, I have. We were in Las Vegas um, about a month ago for a conference for my wife, and you know, it was like 115 every single day. It was miserable. <laughs> I think that's worse that's than the worst close. winter day. I mean, that's, that's probably the closest I mm-hmm. got. You know, nothing in the 120s. But, like, you can't breathe. And, like, you know, your only, your only, your only way to find any, um, you know, find any help from that is just get inside someplace to get with air conditioning. Where in the cold, you can bundle up. I mean, you can, it's not comfortable, but you can compensate with clothing. <laughs> and then where can people uh, reach out to you guys or follow what you're doing? We're um, most active on LinkedIn. So if you look for us on LinkedIn, you can look for me or um, 149 Photos. We have a, a page there. So we, we tend to update that. And then uh, just our website, 149photos.com. Cool. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, until next time, I hope your hammer stays accurate, your Wi-Fi fast, and your work blessed. See everybody. Cool.